Luisa Picaretta, A Collection of Memories of the Servant of God. Chapter 2 Some Unpublished Prayers. My Jesus, I enclose myself in your will so that I may breathe with your breath, to breathe with the breath of all and turn them into so many affectionate kisses. I make my heart beat in your will, to tell you in its every pulsation, I love you, I love you. And moving within your will, I offer to you everyone's embrace, so that in clasping you, embraced by your arms, no one will ever offend you again, and everyone will love you, adore you, bless you, and do your holy will. Be my guide. My sweet Jesus, immure me in your will, so that I see nothing, feel nothing, touch nothing but your holy will. And with your power, make me holy, Jesus, in my acts, to fill heaven and earth with the divine life. O Queen, my mother, be my teacher and my guide, and do not let me draw a single breath without the divine will. Take my will. My Jesus, give me your will and take my own, so that I may be sanctified with your holiness. Love with your love, beat with your heart, walk with your footsteps, repair with your reparation, and form a Jesus with my words in the hearts of all who hear me. Queen, my mother, hide me beneath your mantle to keep me safe from all things and all people. One of the many prayers which the servant of God loved to spread with holy cards, the prayer in her handwriting is written on the back of the holy image. Chapter 3 The Healing of the Epileptic Aunt Rosaria, the last of numerous offspring, was born on April 4th, 1898. My grandmother claimed that she was the only unlucky member of the family in that she was subject to epileptic attacks. In addition, of the middle, fourth, and little fingers of her right hand had been amputated at the joints because of a minor accident. My grandmother, in the hope of a cure, took her to Louisa, a group of girls to whom she taught lace-making were on their way to her house. She asked Louisa to let her join them so that she could learn this craft. Aunt Rosaria was barely nine years old at the time, although she looked older. It was a cold, rainy day in January 1907. Louisa was already famous throughout Corrado, and everyone called her Louisa the Saint. She was not only a woman who lived a holy life, respected by all, but was also a social worker. Indeed, at home, she had set up a lace-making school that in those times was a significant social advancement for many girls who left their homes and the farming environment. This is how the meeting occurred. It was about ten o'clock in the morning when my grandmother went with my aunt to Luisa's house in Via Nazaro Saro, known as Via del Aspidale. Luisa's mother, an elderly woman, came to open the door and stayed chatting to my grandmother, asking her for some for news of some relatives. At the end of the discussion, Louisa's mother took them both into her daughter's room 
where Louisa was giving the girls embroidery lessons from her bed. Angelina, Louisa's sister, had the girls who were making lace leave the room and brought in a chair for my grandmother. My grandmother sat down and the two began to talk. This is my aunt's testimony. They both talked about different matters that I don't remember clearly, like two old friends who had not seen one another for some time. Finally, my mother kissed Louisa and left. I had the impression that they had also been talking about me, and that Louisa had consented to my mother's request. When I was left alone with Louisa, she looked at me with a profoundly benevolent expression, as though she wished to encourage me. I had no suspicion of what was happening, of what was to happen to me later, that I would remain beside her without interruption for forty years. Several days later, my aunt was stricken with a sudden epileptic fit, just as she was being taught the basic elements of lace making. My aunt never related this episode because she was rather shy and reserved about all that concerned Louisa, and rarely mentioned her at home. My mother told me of the event. She had heard it from a friend of hers who was present when it happened. As soon as my aunt fell to the ground in a fit, foaming at the mouth, and with her tongue protruding, the girls in the room were frightened and fled, while my aunt was helped by Angelina, Louisa's sister. In the meantime, Louisa was not in the least upset, but continued her work as if she had not the slightest interest in the event. One girl, who had stayed where she was despite the shock, attest. Louisa, seeing Rosaria on the ground, raised her eyes to heaven and spoke these words. Lord, if you have put her beside me, I want her healthy and she continued her work. Because of the great commotion, no one attached any importance to Louisa's prayer. Whether or not this prayer is true, from that moment Aunt Rosaria suffered no more epileptic fits. She lived to the age of 80 and died from a diabetic crisis. Her illness lasted a day and a half. The Bell of Discord Aunt Rosaria, the co-owner of family property, had renounced in our favor practically half her income, which at that time could be considered a substantial sum, because we were a large family, six children, all at school. She would come for a meal at home almost every day and felt in command of the situation. The work my aunt did at home was invaluable especially as regards domestic chores. She assisted with the cooking, set the table, and helped to clear before she left. Her contribution was much appreciated, for my mother was a teacher, and we were all at school and found it difficult to attend to the housework. The few times that Aunt Rosaria did not come, there was pandemonium and everything was rushed. I remember that when we got back from school, we would always find Aunt Rosaria ready to encourage us to wash our hands and make the sign of the cross before we started eating. Sometimes, however, she gave signs of a strangeness that prompted us, especially my mother, to protest. Her behavior seemed to us insolent, challenging, as though she wanted to assert that it was she who was mistress of the house. This also was influenced by her strong and independent character, which made her reluctant to confide in others. Her presence threw everyone into a certain confusion, no one daring to say a word out of place, and she seldom complied with any of our wishes. She never gave us little gifts or pocket money. She was only available when we showed a desire to go to confession or to church, especially Vespers, which she never missed. She regularly attended the parish of Santa Maria Greca, and she was to be found in the chapel of the Blessed Sacrament, kneeling in her usual place. 
When we looked for her for some family matter, if she was not at Luisa's house, we would find in the church her kneeling in her customary place. One day I said to her, Don't your knees hurt? She smiled at me and, not answering the question, added, This is the place where Luisa knelt when she could come to church, and this is where Luisa spoke to Jesus. Her strange conduct was annoying, and as a result, some rather harsh remarks were made in our household. The causes of the family quarrels, especially between my aunt and my mother, were the following. Very often, while we were eating, our aunt would leave the table in a hurry, put on her overcoat, and go. On other occasions, when important family affairs were being discussed, she would cut the conversation and disappear. This behavior of hers left everyone speechless because it had no logical explanation. Aunt Rosaria was therefore considered a false and hypocritical woman, and my mother attributed this attitude to her pride. Only my father, who was very fond of his sister, kept the balance and always made excuses for her. Provoking the anger of my mother, who felt offended by the lack of consideration he showed for her observations on her aunt. As children, we sided with our mother, considering Aunt Rosaria the black sheep of the family and the object of our sarcasm. Our mother's intervention was required to moderate our indiscreet insistence. In spite of all this, my mother held Aunt Rosaria in high esteem and warned us, Remember, she is nonetheless a consecrated soul. Perhaps what most upset us was that the following day, Aunt Rosaria would present herself at home as though nothing had happened, and never responded to my mother's request for an explanation of her attitudes. As a priest, when my aunt was already very old and the object of the family's veneration, I asked her for the reason for her behavior. She said to me, Do you really want to know? Are you so very interested? Yes, I answered. So she began to speak. I suffered deeply from misunderstandings, but those were the tremendous test to which the Lord subjected me to make me a worthy custodian of Louisa. She used to spend many hours of the day in prayer. I guessed when she wanted to be left alone, without her saying anything to me. I would get up from my work, take her lace-making pillow from her, and put it on the table, and make everyone leave the room. I would draw the curtains round the bed and close her door, and work would continue in silence in the next room. Many hours would pass, and when I heard the bell, I would enter Louisa's room alone. I would draw back the curtains round the bed, and I would put the lace cushion in her hands, so that everyone, returning to her room, would find her as they had left her, intent on her work. In the morning, too, while I was still in bed, I was the only one who heard her bell. Sometimes at about three or four o'clock, her sister, Angelina, grumbled because she was woken by hearing me getting up. I would go to Luisa's room and find her as though dead, showing no signs of life, motionless. I would arrange her hair and put the pillows which I often found on the floor, behind her back. It should be noted that pillows were placed behind Louisa, but she never leaned back on them. They only served to fill the space between her body and the bedhead. Having tidied Louisa, I would prepare the altar for Holy Mass. When the priest arrived for the celebration, I would let him into the room alone. He would make the sign of the cross over her body and call her back to life. Once Louisa had returned to normality, all the others would enter to take part in Holy Mass, including the ever-present altar boy. Louisa participated in Holy Mass as though she were in ecstasy, with very great devotion and responding in perfect Latin. 
After communion, everyone left, while Louisa immersed herself in a lengthy and deep thanksgiving that lasted several hours.